My deep appreciation of theater history was instilled in me by Tom Empey, a college mentor to me and hundreds of others. While teaching Greek theater terms, he would grab the fabric of his slacks and say, You see these pants? Euripides, Eumenides making light of content that could be considered rather dry and stuffy while still maintaining respect for the art, which is what I want to do with this podcast. For each episode, I invite a guest from the many paths my theater career has taken me down. I give my guest no idea what we'll be talking about, but they know we're going to find an outrageous story about theater history and perhaps get a better understanding about why we're still doing it after all these years. So welcome to Euripides Humanities, and I am your host, Aaron Odom. Good morrow to you, all my Eumenidites. This is Aaron Odom from Trident Theater in Sheridan, Wyoming, bringing you another episode of Euripides Eumenides, a theater history podcast. If you've been a fan of the show, I have an update for you, as it relates to a previous episode. In my exploration of the Broadway production of K-Pop the Musical, there was a piece of the discussion that centered around the fact that perhaps the short run of the musical on Broadway was for the purpose of getting a Tony nomination. As I'm recording this, the Tony nominations have been out for several weeks. And guess what, Eumenidites? It happened. K-pop was nominated for three awards. Best Original Score, Best Choreography, and Best Costume Design. I know I wish it all the best, but as we suggested on that episode, whether it wins or not, K-pop can now forever be billed as K-pop, the Tony-nominated musical. And a slight change there if it wins at least one of those three awards. In any case, let's give some love to new listeners in new areas. Hello, Belgium. Glad to have you with us, and great work on the waffles. <laughs> and hello to my listeners in Israel. Well done. I'm glad you've joined us. You are all here by officially Eumenidites. <laughs> okay, I brought you all here for a reason. I've had this topic sitting on the back burner for a while, but found a great scenario to bring it to the front line. As you may have heard from recent episodes, I just recently performed in a local production of the mega farce Noises Off, one of my truly favorite plays, and I got the opportunity to play it in my hometown 15 years after directing a production in my hometown. If you haven't been in that production, or any farce for that matter, it's one that requires absolute teamwork, mutual respect between actors, and since it's something of an ensemble piece, not one real character stands out. So, there must be this air about the production of working to make all of your fellow actors look good with everything you do. To sum up, a very cooperative environment must be installed in order to make things function well. I'll say we definitely had that. But my guests on this episode were three of my castmates, Ryan Legler, Tess Lannon, and Patrick Kossel, who listeners may remember from prior episodes. All of us have wildly varying backgrounds in the world of theater, from amount of experience to levels of experience in the professional world, all of which is quite valuable. So I thought it would be appropriate for such a cooperative group to hear about one of the more surprising backstage rivalries I've ever heard of. So, without further ado, I give you this episode, Maggie Smith versus Laurence Olivier. But yeah, we've just been kind of shooting the breeze here. Uh, we got a night off of rehearsal. That I have three of our cast members here. Ryan Legler, hello. Hello. Tess Lannon, hello. Hi. And Patrick Kossel, hello. hello. And by the time this thing airs, we will have been done with our run of Noises Off. I mean, it has been... We killed it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Positive. Blew it off the... <laughs> it was no, it was yeah. now, Just nailed it. Now, now you've, you've absolutely <laughs> damned it. I mean, the worst thing we do is say the Scottish play in here, and the set's going to break down. <laughs> you mean... <laughs> Isn't it that one? <laughs> that one set of stairs is going to fall off. Oh, my God. <laughs> but I, I have to say, like, you know, this is one of those shows that requires, like, really solid teamwork. You know, it's one of my favorite sayings about improv is that you're not there to make yourself look good. You're there to make everybody else look good. And if you do that, they'll, they'll return in kind. 
I would say I think we've done that pretty well. What do you think? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know, the show is written to be, you know, it's, it is it is like the proto-farce. It's like take all farces, put them into a blender, and mish, mishmash it up. But these characters, some of them we might recognize. I mean, Tess, you probably have the most recognizable character type in, like, your character is like the, the dumb blonde bimbo. The dumb blonde bimbo. <laughs> that's also the sex pot, the eye candy. That's that's a type that we're like, okay, I recognize yeah, that. Yeah. Patrick is the very harried, uh, <laughs> uh, overworked, underpaid. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Dad, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> I shaved. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then Ryan is playing this character that just like. Dumb as rocks. <laughs> well, and there's you're my favorite. <laughs> oh, sensitive. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just a completely oblivious uh, aristocrat. And that is a very interesting point as well. I said it uh, quite a bit in my last episode or a couple episodes ago about Hamlet, where you know one of the fun things about seeing a new Hamlet is seeing that actor who you already probably have seen in different things bring what they bring to the table for a Hamlet, you know? And that ugh, that's kind of been an annoying thing. <laughs> Sometimes it's like, when it's like stuff yes. for up and coming actors. Yes. They're like, oh we think you can join the club. Here, take the skull. <laughs> Let's see what you do. With Stop all... drinking from it. Stop it. <laughs> we'll, we'll put up your picture in the wall of fame. Okay, you've done the Hamlet. But I think what's interesting about this one is, yeah, there are those kind of certain character types, but we all are bringing ourselves into that. Each of those characters is you from another universe. You know yeah. what I mean? Where... But isn't that the fun of acting, mm -hmm. too? Oh, it, yeah. It's like... Ooh, I get to be myself, but under these different set of circumstances. If I was born in these set of circumstances, yeah. this is how I would behave. Exactly. No, yeah. I love it. Mm -hmm. I love it. So, I would say, though, that uh, one of the biggest things in this production is our cooperation with each other. I mean, you know, the whole second act is like, we are so dependent on each other to get the mm -hmm. right thing or bring the right prop or be in the right place to make it look as though oh my gosh everything is fall the, the wheels are falling off of this thing and i mean the work that goes in to perfecting <laughs> making something look like it's absolute chaos i mean it requires us to just be absolutely supportive of each other well i think we're lucky because we have a well cast group yeah. that all wants to work together we're here for fun mm -hmm. and so there's no egos to worry about we're all just kind of cooperating naturally so you know fun. that's a funny that, not a funny point but an interesting point to bring to that this is a community theater production mm -hmm. so we're all volunteer this is the hardest i've ever worked for free <laughs> <laughs> like what the hell i was sure. not expecting this <laughs> but i do think you know you, you mentioned community theater i think community theater can be very cliquish mm -hmm. but so, to that point, uh -oh. I'm going to throw a question at you and see if we can come up with any kind of response. If you have one, if you've ever thought about this, when you think about, like, famous, famous, famous actors, what's your favorite rivalry between actors and why? Oh, that's going to be Hugh Jackman and Ryan Reynolds because it's absolute comedy. Oh, and oh my there. God. That's... Jackman is going to reprise Wolverine because of Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> yeah. This 55-year-old man is getting yeah. back in the shape of his life. <laughs> but they have this huge, like, very public, very, very ridiculous rivalry and it's it's hilarious and you should watch anything you can between the two of them because it's so much fun mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i would agree with um the rock and kevin hart they are fun oh yeah yeah they're a fun yeah. duo um well you know what you talk about rivalries you just nailed one yep the rock and vin diesel Oh, that, yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a that real, is a yeah. real rival. Now, okay, I don't know you, anything uh, like i know about that but i, I don't i don't know any details story that does anybody I mean, all of a sudden, it just was like, you know, those guys hate each other. Well, you know, it's just like community theater when two large egos. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting we came up with that. So I'm going to go ahead and start today uh, completely sidestepping that question for just a moment. I'm going to start with a quote from George Bernard Shaw. Do the English people want a national theater? Of course they do not. They never want anything. They got the British Museum, the National Gallery, and Westminster Abbey, but they never wanted them. But once these things stood as mysterious phenomena that had come to them, 
They were quite proud of them and felt that the place would be incomplete without them. So what does it actually mean to be a national theater? Well, on one hand, that usually implies sponsorship from the government. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it's not just a national theater, but a federal theater. And of course, we don't necessarily have one of these in the United States. We have the National Endowment for the Arts. It oh, does, yeah. Yeah. It doesn't like fully fund yeah. a single theater. Like it does help people in trouble sometimes. It's my understanding of this. We have the Kennedy Center, which, you know, grants awards and, and says this is kind of, you know, the cultural landmark, but it's not necessarily the Northern Star that we, you know, guide our ships by as far as how a theater goes in this country, right? Outside of funding sources and thus expectations of what should be shown at this national theater, I found a great quote on what it means to be a national theater in an article from the British publication, The Guardian. Put the word national in your name and you become a receptacle for a country's values. Mm -hmm. In what you do, the nation will seek to see the very definition of itself, a definition perhaps vaguely articulated, but intensely felt. End quote. That's, that's fair. If you think about, like, when somebody says to you, yeah, that, that is in the National Archives. Yeah! Immediately, you have a higher level of thinking, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's immediately raised the prestige Ooh, of that. Yes, right, right. So, it raises the prestige. Yeah, absolutely. Right. But it also says this is definitive yes, of our absolutely. cultural yeah. identity. Yeah, so if right? I have the National Archives, that's exactly what I'm looking for, uh -huh. right? I'm looking for true U.S. history. But calling it National Theater gets you a stamp of approval. Boom! Right. Now, despite Shaw's quote from earlier, and of course, Shaw had a critical opinion of government-sponsored theater, but specifically theater that would embrace a national identity, and after a century of humming and hawing around the concept of developing a national theater for the UK, a national theater company finally became somewhat established in the early 1960s. And from this company, this is what we get here at the YO with the subscription to the National Theater. We get to see those productions come over to us. So having first been a suggestion in the 1840s and remaining a topic of debate since then, Parliament finally passed the National Theater Bill in 1949 and £1 million was set aside for the project. That is the equivalent of approximately £4.5 billion today. They were so cultural. They got like a NASA budget. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard of any British rockets, my friend. <laughs> so that funding, that funding was intended for the construction of a new theater building and the equipment to run the theater. The structure was to be built on the south bank of the Thames River. In 1951, the Queen Mother, who just recently passed, was the guest of honor at a ceremony in which the foundation stone for this new theater building was to be placed. However, the <laughs> Queen herself even made the joke that perhaps the foundation stone should have been built with casters on the bottom. And she wasn't alone in the critique of the progress of finalizing building plans. Quote, progress stalled, proposals came and went. Indeed, at one point, critics Kenneth Tynan and Richard Findlater despairing at lack of progress, staged a mock funeral for the National Theater. <laughs> <laughs> Who was making these plans? Why couldn't they agree? They the government. Billions. Well, like, a, a bunch of artists. <laughs> <laughs> they put a, should have put a stage manager in charge. <laughs> so, in order to avoid complete stagnation of the development of the company, some efforts were made to restore the public's faith in Parliament's dedication to the project. In August 1962, Sir Lawrence Olivier was named the company's artistic director. And this was, in my opinion, a particularly impressive move by Parliament, as Olivier already had international fame at that point and enough approval in his own country that Parliament could see that the public would approve of his vision of creating a theater that would represent the UK as a people and a culture. And he also played Hamlet. <laughs> <laughs> Did he really? Yeah. yeah. He was one of the best. Oh, yeah. 1948. So they got, like, the, the Michael Jordan... You know, yep. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, we yes. got a thing. We need a face. Mm -hmm. You know, was 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 so was he brought to like not only like appease the people who are like you know what's the deal with it, but like kickstart the they they appointed him as the artistic director. So okay. he's in control of oh, the creative okay. vision 
of the National Theater. So he made a $4 billion theater, right? Well, okay. So the $4 billion <laughs> was still hanging out to build the building. Oh. But some of that did go to fund, like, okay, we're going to at least do some productions, right? So Thanks. Parliament actually offered the Old Vic, which is this great old theater building in London. Uh, they offered that to the company as performance space until the miasma of bureaucracy around the creation of the new space could be untangled. Under Olivier's early direction, the performance offerings of the company fared somewhat better than the construction of the building. On October 22, 1963, the National Theater Company opened its first production, Hamlet, uh, uh, boom, with Peter O'Toole in the title role. What? Yeah. Really? Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Okay. See and this is when Peter O'Toole was in his 30s. Whoa. Well, well, he had just been seen in Lawrence of Arabia well, the well, year before. Well. Yeah, right? And at that time was known as one of the rising stars in the British acting world. Get your Hamlet. Okay. And despite middling critical acclaim, the draw to this Hamlet was seeing a new and extraordinary celebrity talent on stage performing one of the hallmark pieces of British theater. Hmm. Not we want to go see what our national theater is. It's like, hey, cool celebrities playing Hamlet. Let's go watch. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, so so, so is their thing. national theater like geared That's... to be like, hey, this is like England's A team of theater in a like... way. It, it it also I think Patrick made a great analogy about the National Archives. Uh, I would say it's a lot. They intended it to be like what the Smithsonian system is ah, okay. to American culture. Okay. It's like this is our. This is our collection of history. This is the stuff that's got the federal seal of approval, right? Mm -hmm. So the National Theater was invented to be like, what does it mean to be British and what is our expression as British theater artists? But you already had like the okay, so theater company and other companies doing the, almost the same thing. Right. So, so they think that they can like express their national identity appropriately through a government funded like huge mm -hmm. like a-list like yeah. broadway sort of deal okay because when i originally heard of this idea i thought oh a nationally funded theater thing hey how cool would that be it's just like uh sheridan you get like uh, 10 grand a year mm -hmm. to put on and to pay whoever whoever's like because i feel like that would be a very accurate snapshot of like our culture in right. its time to be archived well what were they doing in land or what were they doing mm -hmm. in north carolina at their theater what were they doing and, you know? and the very interesting thing about that is it is almost the polar opposite. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, they're trying to encapsulate everything over the, like the best idea they can of what what it means to be British. The American culture is so incredibly oh diverse. Yeah. Like it's yeah. it would be so impossible. Well, you know? and I think that Brian brought up a good point. What are they doing in in Sheridan and yeah. in North Carolina? And yeah, and you're right. It's because we're so so freaking big, and, mm -hmm. and the cultures are so right. Wow. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So, Olivier looks at this draw to celebrity, like you were just saying. We're going to, oh, they like it when we put our celebrities out for people to see and come see our shows. Even though Royal Shakespeare Company is doing that like crazy at this time, too. Um, but he saw great potential in this, particularly in capturing the attention of the public. While he ran the National, he saw the company as something of a mentorship program for up-and-coming talented artists who generally also turned out to be celebrities. Mm -hmm. Olivier would have something of a dual role in that he often would play a lead role opposite some of these newcomers. This was his way hmm. of making it look as though a new artist would be mentored by the older and more established artist, a concept that does indeed have merit, and had varying levels of success and failure yeah, under Olivia's direction. Somebody off here. Mm, you think so? Okay. So, it uh, and, uh, it. Getting back to that uh, question we started with. Yeah, uh, 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 well, let me give you kind of a, a laundry list of some of the artists who came into this. Some of the earliest ones to be recruited included old guard actors Michael Redgrave and Cyril Cusack, big names in British theater. And some relative newcomers, Billy Whitelaw, Frank Finlay, Derek Jacobi, oh. Robert Stevens, and Michael Gambon. Oh, I know that guy. Yeah. Batman. <laughs> Dumbledore. Although he kind of looks like him. Anyway. However, one such talent who was recruited by Olivier, who was still working and impressing audiences, was Maggie Smith. Oh. 
Dame Maggie Smith. Dame oh. Maggie Smith. Ew. I bet they got along great. <laughs> now, younger listeners might know Smith from her roles as Professor McGonagall from the Harry Potter film series or as the Dowager Countess from Downton Abbey. Or, where is it? In, in Hook. She was Wendy. Wendy. Yeah. She was Wendy in she Hook. was the old lady Wendy. And sh- they did such a Oh my a God, good, yeah, she was. Holy they God. did such a freaking good makeup job on yeah. her when I saw her again into the 2000s. It's like, <laughs> what happened? Yeah, exactly. You you're know? like, oh, she was 90 years old in 1991. Exactly. And then she comes out in Harry Potter and you're like, wait a minute, you look like that 10 years ago. <laughs> and now you look 10 years younger, 10 years <laughs> later than you did 20 years ago. <laughs> she took the death becomes her potions anyway um so but she's had this huge career and it goes back decades and in the 1960s she was a very young and impressive talent and was gathering quite a bit of celebrity as well it didn't exactly hurt that she was quite conventionally attractive as well perfect fodder for olivier's new company she was recruited into the company quite easily and while there were other pieces that the two appeared in together when Smith was first recruited into the company, arguably the most memorable pairing was the famous and infamous version of Othello, staged in 1963. <laughs> that's just got a big smile on her face. I bet it just went great. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's why I'm talking about it on the show. Yeah. An absolute success. <laughs> this was particularly memorable for a number of reasons but particularly for the impressive performances of the production's two stars. Smith took something as a surprising approach to her Desdemona. It would seem that by that time, previous actors who played the role can be remembered in a certain way. They were almost akin to the stereotypical character of the California Valley Girl. Mm. That was how, I mean, just in my research at that time, people were like, yeah, she's just dim and flighty and all she wants is her boy to lie. Yeah. Really? Uh huh. Is that how she's portrayed or how she's written? That I think is how directors up to that time just saw oh, her. And okay. then it just became kind of the trend to have Be, her go that Have an airy woman? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Well, hey, it was a more superficial attraction than a love. Oh, yeah. check this out. Here's a quote I found on the difference between prior versions and Maggie Smith's version. Many Desdemonas are relatively demure, fluffy little things whom almost anyone would be tempted to strangle. (laughs) Which happens at the end. Not Maggie's. Hers was a cool, intelligent, sexual young woman who knew precisely what she wanted, a big black warrior, and didn't care whom she shocked, including her father, to get him. End quote. She's famous. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, wait, okay, keep going. Keep going. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> However, while Smith's performance represented a new and impressive way for a woman to make her mark in a classic role, <laughs> it was Olivier who really made the headlines with his performance. Oh, God. What did he play? Well, oh, God. You see, it's still something of a checklist for a great actor to play all of the great classic Shakespearean tragic heroes. Did you get us into it? And up to this <laughs> point, <clears throat> Olivier had played all of them to great acclaim, all of them but Othello. Well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So when he believed he had the perfect cast to do it, he set out to complete his circuit. Okay. Hmm. Oh, Robert Downey Jr. Oh, God. <laughs> this is 1963. Yeah. Okay? To do this, Olivier applied an intense amount of focus. By the time he played the role, he was 57 years old. But that didn't prevent him from achieving his goal. He trained extensively to give him the physique he hoped to achieve. I remember, God, it was in my my undergrad. Somebody had told me about the uh, exercise he went through and what he could do. Like, he could jump off of a 12-foot platform onto a stage and land without a roll. Like, not having to roll or anything, just feet flat on the on the stage and, like, totally absorb it into his legs and stand it up. Damn, Daddy. 57. <laughs> 57. So yeah. painful. Yeah. Uh, he only now. did it once. Yeah. <laughs> and then he got Ow. <laughs> <laughs> My knees are now powdered. <laughs> He trained his voice away from the tenor that most of us are familiar with, lowering his voice to a juicy baritone. 
All of this was what he believed he needed to achieve in order to convince his audiences that he was indeed a powerful, lusty black man. I mean, it worked <laughs> But of course, he didn't stop there. Oh, no. Um, the cod piece. Uh, <laughs> in addition to whitening his fingernails and, according to rumors, even adding dyes to his mouth and tongue to make the insides of his mouth more red and vibrant, the real problem was how to alter his skin color to present what he wanted. And if you know anything about Olivier, you know he liked to use hair and makeup effects to meet his goals. I mean, you talk about the Hamlet, mm -hmm. the blonde wig. Yeah. You know, and in a black and white movie by choice. Uh, when he played uh, Richard III, had a big, like, makeup nose and, you know, had, like, a hump in his... So, he, I mean, he was kind of a chameleon, but he liked to use the hair and makeup. Kind of a Lon Chaney. Yeah, yeah, in a I'm way, sending... in a way, uh, you might think about that differently after this quote. Um, okay. Oh, boy. Look, he aimed at a blue-black Nubian color and at every single performance covered himself from top to toe in three layers, allowing each one to dry. Wow. The process took three hours. His dresser then polished him with a piece of chiffon until he shone. Finally, he sprayed a very fine mineral oil. He was literally and metaphorically untouchable. End quote. He didn't even try to go subtle. <laughs> For it. Well, I mean, uh, okay. 4.5 million dollars. <laughs> so, I mean, this is this is actually kind of like, I, 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 I am not defending this choice in any way, shape, or form. I need to declare that right now. But in 1963, mm -hmm. in Britain, they're just like, well, you know, this is kind of what we do. And I want to say it was like within the last five to ten years that the Metropolitan Opera finally told their white actors you're not going to play Otello anymore because the way they would do it is they cover themselves in blackface mm. and, and i mean it was just like today we're like yeah, and and i'm like i said i'm not trying to defend it it was just the time let me see if i can find this and i'll show you <laughs> oh my gosh you have stuff. yeah oh uh-huh oh that's oh that's, that's terrible that's real bad it's it's not great that's yeah it's real real bad uh-huh he know. looks like a white man in black makeup. Yes, he absolutely does. Yes. So she kicked his ass. Oh, hold on. <laughs> I'm ready for that. <laughs> but Olivier had the method he believed would best achieve his goals, and listeners can judge for themselves how they did with the film version of this play that is now available for public consumption. You can just go out and watch it. Despite having this method to play Othello, Olivier seemed to have some difficulties with being challenged on stage by actors <laughs> with their own ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Such as Dame Maggie Smith. In she wasn't a Dame back then. No, no, she wasn't. Yeah. Yeah, but I want to give her the respect. She earned it. My God. In the play's opening, when Desdemona greets her husband, the returning war hero, Dame Maggie, felt that there should be at least some sort of physical contact between the two lovers. Yeah. A hug, a that kiss, hold hands. But Olivier forbade it. More worried that his makeup would come off if he came into contact with anyone. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it wasn't like he disagreed with their acting choice. He it was just like, pain. no, this whole thing will fall apart. He actually did try to defend it through acting choices. Oh. That's like, well, if you kiss me, my, my makeup will come off. He would just say, no, that's not going to happen. And try to justify it. I just don't think my character would kiss you. <laughs> I just, my wife, my after wife. I've come back from war, <laughs> I just don't think, think I want to it. <laughs> Which, you know, that does bring up an interesting point. Like, I love the idea. I, I, I first heard about this. I have a, a friend who was a, a college English teacher for a long time, and there have been those people out there who have been like, you know, I think Othello and Iago were kind of into each other. Right? Like, why is Iago so jealous of Desdemona, Othello's lover? So he's got to be gay for him, right? <laughs> In one of her classes, she had a veteran student stand up and go, You don't understand the bond between soldiers. Oh. Mm -hmm. Because literally, every day, that person could die in front of you or vice versa. 
If that person get, has a grenade thrown in front of them, you are expected to jump on it to save other people's lives. That's the bonds of brotherhood. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. That that makes sense. Makes some sense. But then again, Olivier is just, I think, just trying to be the most important thing on the stage. So Olivier says, no, that's, that's not going to happen. Maggie couldn't keep her opinions to herself, though, and is remembered to have said the following after another rebuke from Olivier in rehearsal. I'm going to try to do this in my best cockney. Here we go. I've come all the way from Venice to see you. You want the war. I'm pleased to see you. What do you want me to do? Back away in fucking aura? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Maybe you know she was cockney. Oh, yeah, well, I... I look, this is the quote. They like they. Oh yeah, like, yeah. They the apostrophe o r r o r. Maybe they had an issue with public display of affection. That might have been. They are Could British. Have been. Could have been. Well, <laughs> oh, dude, well, we're talking about the time. Just like uh, what was it? Nineteen sixty four was the first interracial kiss between Captain Kirk. Oh and yeah. Oh, yeah. So our, oh, yeah. Audiences were not even were True. not comfortable True. seeing people of two different races. Mm -hmm. You know, even though they try to make it a little more palatable by having a white man portray him. Right. You know? right. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, diversity, though. I mean, Captain Kirk, he didn't care what color you were. White? She had a great oh, green? Yeah. yeah. You could be a Vulcan, you could be a Klingon, he'd bang you. Yeah. Yeah. Reptile yeah. face? Awesome. That's yeah. The future. <laughs> <laughs> so check this out. After that rehearsal in which she said that, and of course, just like we all did, I'm sure there was some laughter, probably subdued because they're like, oh God, I don't want to get fired by Libby. He probably break my head off. <laughs> After that rehearsal, Olivier took Dame Maggie's lover, Robert Stevens, aside and apparently said, please tell her to stay away from me on the stage. I don't mind if she looks like a cunt, but I'm buggered if I'm going to look like one. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> I mean, couldn't professionally just go to her and say, hey, um, you know, I'm well, trying to establish something here. I'm trying to be, you know, the professional. A, you can't talk to the but, woman directly. Oh, you have to go through her feet. That's the shitty thing about it. He's calling her four-letter word to her lover and said, Not can you have this message for me? And he probably did it. Because he didn't want to get fired. He's probably afraid of her. <laughs> well, yeah. She's just publicly, like, shamed her. You know what I mean? Not like, only that, but I his bet. reputation. You need to kick your so woman in like, check. He probably realized, okay, I can't intimidate her, so mm -hmm. it's like, I'll go to maybe somebody who yeah. has some right. bull. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? Well, yeah, yeah. And, and you're not wrong. You're not wrong. And probably also, uh, like, as you were suggesting, Tess, I mean, somebody who he could level with. Your woman is crazy right now. Keep her away from She's me. hysterical. She's having women problems. Ugh. Obviously, how, it's women problems. How demeaning and disrespectful is it for him to go to him? Yeah, yeah he's instead of going to her. He's, yeah. it's, I, I see it, totally, in my opinion, as a straight disrespect. It's absolute it's yeah. straight disrespect. Yeah, he yeah. didn't respect he's... her enough to say it to her face. No, absolutely well, not. Well, like I said, because cause she could put him in his place But again. it doesn't matter. He no, could just fire her. Mm -hmm. He'd be like, he's... fine, bitch, get out. But he did it on purpose. Yeah, I, well, I, it I feels very it's calculated. A, a well, and I, I also... I also have to say, knowing a little bit about Olivier too, this is I, I don't want to think that this is characteristic of him, but at the same time, I think this came out of a fit of embarrassment and yeah. anger and everything. Inadequacy. Still no defense. I mean, the only other defense I can think of is he's running the National Theater and he's got to command some respect. Sorry, dude. Can't be a dick. Well, I mean, it's, it's obvious, you know, it sounded like he had a diva moment, you know, yep. which is yeah. uh, common in all artistic endeavors. So, like I said, I don't want to suggest that that was necessarily characteristic, but... Um... Well, he's probably also feeling very insecure because there's this young lady that's switching up theater as they know it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, she's a badass. Exactly. <laughs> After that incident in front of the cast... He also publicly tried to humiliate her in front of the cast in future rehearsals mm -hmm. by giving her rudimentary pronunciation notes. <sighs> what a man. Yeah, so see, I, 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 I feel like it's, it's more incidental than what we're implying, but I, it feels like more of like an ego, you know, bruise, and, and I'm top dog, and mm -hmm. she's the young yeah. challenger, mm -hmm. you know. But I'm sure that that whole backdrop empowered him further. Well, yeah, and I think if you consider the times in the 60s, exactly. 
you know, it definitely was much more of a male dominated society. Oh yeah. And so I do think Ryan's right. You're definitely dealing with that, that here's this young upstart, be it male or male or female, who's putting him in his place, mm -hmm. add to the fact that mm -hmm. it's a woman. And he's like, how dare a woman talk to me like that? Or how dare a young upstart talk mm -hmm. to me like that? Mm -hmm. Do you know who I am? I mean, there's also like a way to look at her and go, okay, all right, that was funny. Oh, Maybe okay. we can talk about this later. You know, I, I mean, they wouldn't have the capacity to do something mm, like that. No, no. Okay. However, did this stir Dame Maggie? Oh, oh no. <laughs> Soon after, as the play was nearing production, she passed by his dressing room when his door was open. Okay. And there stood Olivier, completely nude from head to toe, <laughs> covered in his dark makeup. Drying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's the door. You've got five minutes. <laughs> In response to this visual, <laughs> as Maggie passed by his room, she then leaned her head back around the door frame oh. and slowly uttered, How now, brown cow? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, Olivier didn't quite understand the joke and complimented Smith on her attention to diction, which he was berating her for in all of those <laughs> rehearsals afterwards. Some time into the performance schedule, Olivier had already begun thinking about how to apply this company that he had around him to future productions. He was deeply interested in getting a production of Thornton Wilder's Skin of Our Teeth stage with himself in the lead and Maggie Smith as the female lead. But due to other commitments and new avenues opening up, Smith politely declined Olivier's suggestion several times. After one such attempt before a performance, Olivier seemed to be particularly aggravated with Smith. And in a scene where he was to strike her with a letter oh. he had just received, <laughs> Olivier instead slapped Smith so hard in the face, he knocked her out. Oh, with geez. his hand? With his hand. Okay. Like, you're cold. You should have used the letter. Yeah. Uh, he yeah. Actor Frank Finlay, who was also on stage at the time, had to improvise a scenario in which his character had to drag an unconscious Desdemona out of the room. That's assault. <laughs> Uh -huh. Yeah, did he yeah. get trouble? Oh, he's the head of the, the 60s. He's, the, he's like, sorry, I'm method. Yeah. Well, you know how women can get. I, I, I didn't discuss this with you before, I'm sorry. <laughs> so what you're saying is he wanted to sleep with her. <laughs> Think about it. If he's continuously going after her for all these oh, things, yeah. and she's saying no, and he's insistent, he wanted to fuck her. I definitely think it has to do with some the rebuke, you know, whether yeah. it be for his But he kept going after her. Or, like, if he was truly insulted and be like, that bitch, she ain't never coming on anything I'm doing again. He, she just insulted me in front of everybody, and I am Lawrence Olivier. But no, he keeps saying, come back, come back, yeah. play my opposite. I don't I think that, I think he probably got over that because she was so, he recognized her talent, you know? You're right. And then, but <laughs> like, what, you're not going to be in my next? I was, I, I, I got over myself and I asked you to be in my next play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like how you're leading with your pelvis on. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, check this out, though. When Smith finally came to in the wings, she said, Well, that's the first time I've seen any fucking stars at the National. She's a beast. <laughs> She's savage. I love it. I saw that quick. Knocked out on stage in front of an audience by Laurence Olivier and drops that juicy wow. one. Oh, She's, no, always, like She's always been Lady Rantha. Oh, man. Yep. One of my favorite things about stories like these is that they seem like magnets. On one side they repulse, and on the other side they attract. Sure, might seem like icky gossip, but this story got this group to explore some very sensitive but necessary territory when it comes to acting in the modern world, and you'll hear that near the conclusion. But before we get to that, I'd like to remind you to rate and or review this show wherever you're listening. Check out Euripides Amenities on Instagram, where you get even further into the episodes. And hey, slip into our DMs if you have some ideas about future episodes. But let's get back to the conclusion of Maggie Smith versus Laurence Olivier. As the run went on, Olivier's performance started to become more and more of a minstrel show than a legitimate performance because he... Was, he was sexually frustrated. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
And Olivier very, apparently violently defended this. Like, he wrote this thing. He's like, no, it's okay for me to be a black man. But at the same time, <laughs> surrounding himself with some of the most talented young actors at the time caused him to be even more jealous when they received any sort of critical praise. He was not at all ready to be upstaged in his performance of Othello, particularly not by the actor playing Iago, and definitely not by his Desdemona. Yet, it was their performances that consistently got better reviews. Mm -hmm. So, of course, he was forced to work with the actors he recruited again, despite his jealousy often getting the better of him. Mm -hmm. So, I think, yes, there's a part of it where he's like, okay, we might not be getting along very well, but I think we have onstage chemistry, chemistry that really works, and we could apply it to this show. She's going... No, I already have other stuff well, lined up. Yeah, and, and he's under a, a lot of pressure being named the head of the theater. Mm -hmm. So it's just like he doesn't, you know, want to see it fail. So mm -hmm. probably knows he has to swallow his pride to save his pride. Right. Yeah. To yeah, but he's still a narcissist and isn't aging gracefully. That still doesn't excuse him not to. Yeah, he tells it. Assault isn't hand. good. Oh. In 1964. The National Theatre put on Ibsen's The Master Builder. Olivier cast British stage veteran Michael Redgrave to be the lead role. However, Redgrave had a reputation for letting his alcohol addiction get the better of him. And before the play opened, many critics were commenting on if the actor would be able to stay coherent on stage. Oof. Yeah, poor guy. However, at this point in his life, in 1964, Redgrave was in actually the early stages of Parkinson's disease. Oh my God. But very few people could tell the difference. They just thought it was kind of some of his... They're like, oh no, he's in withdrawals. Give him more vodka. Yeah, right? <laughs> exactly. Oh. He's over there going, no, please. So June 9th, 1964, opening night, Redgrave's illness caused his memory to jump all over the place in the script during performance. And Maggie was doing everything she could to keep the show on the road and coherent for the audience. Oh my goodness. To the point where people didn't even know at the end. Ooh. Uh-huh. While many were none the wiser, people close to the show knew that Redgrave was a liability for the remaining run and the upcoming tour. On that opening night performance, after it was done, Olivier burst into Redgrave's dressing room and almost incoherently berated him. Like, just apoplectic. You, you couldn't even understand, right? There was really nothing that Redgrave could do. It was his illness that was making him not be able to perform the role. So in order to prevent further disaster, Olivier removed Redgrave and took over the part from then on, which pitted him against Maggie Smith as his stage counterpart and frequent onstage foil. <laughs> Despite this casting change, it was not Olivier who received positive reviews as he expected. Those went to Maggie Smith. Unfortunately, Olivier's ego seemed to get the better of him again. Once those very positive reviews began coming out, Olivier is reported to have said this to her in her dressing room before a performance one night. Oh, by the way, I understand that one of the critics says that you almost act me off the stage. If I may say so, darling angel, in the second act, you almost bored me off the stage. You were so slow. Can you imagine the juxtaposition of, I hate her, I hate her, I hate her, I want her, I want her, I want her, and this, I'm going to berate you, but secretly I'm just doing it so I can be around you. <laughs> I used to pull a girl's ponytail. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's exactly it. We're like talking kindergarten stuff, right? Because yeah, yeah. I like you so much, like, I want your attention. Yeah, I got old. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was more just like, I'm sorry, this is my only thing. He didn't have any other moves. Oh, yeah. oh my God. So you were getting down on the bottom of it. Okay. See, we figured this out. So here's Robert Stevens, Maggie's <laughs> lover, about her reaction to being told she was going too slow. She picked up her cues so quickly the next night, you couldn't slip a razor blade between the lines. <laughs> Olivier fluffed and dried all over the shop. He paid for his mistake by being made to look like a complete monkey. It was after that experience that he said to me in the street he would never act with her again. Nor did he. Good. She finally got peace. Well, they finished the run and, and he never asked her to do anything again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sounds like she won that round. You think so? Okay. However, oh. here's a quote from the then National Company member William Gaskell. 
about the juxtaposition of Dame Maggie and Sir Lawrence together in the Master Builder. This quote. Their first encounter was the greatest moment in the theater I have ever known. They were electric. I shall never forget it. It was as good as anything I've ever seen. A kind of excitement had taken over. That's cool. And that's something. Yeah. That's like, not surprising, though. It, I mean, but it, it's fortunate that it translated in that way. Yeah. But it totally can. Yeah. I mean, on one hand, it's kind of cool. It's also like, you know, you could do this without all of the impassionate or the passionate stuff going on backstage. Yeah. Like, she's mm -hmm. doing her damnedest to just maintain her status, which mm -hmm. he is as well. Cool. But imagine what you could get done if you put your egos aside. <laughs> Don't you guys like have seen or can agree that sometimes amidst conflict, mm. the result, mm. you know, it can turns be electric. out right. You know, right. apparently it wasn't you know hotcakes working for Steve Jobs. Yeah, I mean? right. Yeah, but, uh, you, you know, and I'm not saying that to justify anybody's behavior or whatever like that. Mm -hmm. I'm just suggesting that they have. It sounded like they had such potent feelings. Yeah for each other that mm -hmm. that ended up yeah. translating on stage yeah you know i mean there's another side to it too that none of the audience is coming to this because oh i hear they're uh really in like right. on fire right. backstage oh yeah it would, you know they're, they're like oh i'm just yeah. coming because yeah. Lawrence. Will, yeah but yeah i think and i wish i can remember or give you examples off the top of my head but i can't unfortunately but um you hear well no here's a, a musically um who here is familiar with the band joy division mm -hmm. Okay, I figured you might be. Mm -hmm. um, so when Joy Division was formed, Bernard, and I can't remember his last name, and Peter Hook hated each other. Mm -hmm. And they're the founding members of Joy Division. Joy Division just narrowly, well, probably not narrowly, but just missed being voted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame this year. In fact, they made the announcements this morning. However, once Ian Curtis committed suicide and Joy Division ended, they went on and continued creating music together. They formed a band, New Order, which mm -hmm. is freaking huge. Yeah. New Order was a gigantic techno band throughout the early 80s. And you also hear about uh, movies and such where you watch the film and you're like, wow, mm -hmm. how incredible. And then you find out later the actor and actresses or the two actors just freaking hated each other. Mm -hmm. They couldn't even be around each other unless they were doing their scene and then they had to get off right away. Yeah. They hated each other. I mean, there's a level to that, though, that you're like, God, it's unfortunate. But that I they had to put themselves into that position it, to be able to create. I think Ryan kind of hit on it, or maybe it was Tess, I don't remember who, but when you have that energy, whether it be negative or, or, or positive, if you can figure out a way to harness it into yourself and put out there, and maybe it is just you're just trying to one-up each other, but either way, you give an amazing performance, and the audience sees that, and they're like, wow! See, there's a point to that where I go, okay, <laughs> yeah, you can channel that, and you can use that uh, positively. In the acting world now, there is so much emphasis being placed on actor safety, which I wholeheartedly endorse. And do you think that, that uh, sometimes gets in the way of artistic expression? Though? I think it can, but at the same time, the things that we have to do on stage are sometimes so intimate that. Yes sometimes those intimate things are difficult for people to do because they are connected to past traumas. And there is a lot being done to help people like understand this. Like, Tess, I had to kiss you on the cheek uh, as my character. And I asked you, is that okay? You're like, yes. I'm like, okay, so where is an, an appropriate place? This is all coming from this idea of like, like if I were to kiss you on the neck, and you and I didn't tell you that's where I was going to go. I could be it, shocking. It could be a, a trigger of something that has happened to you in the past, mm -hmm. and thereby I am adding to uh, maybe some mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And that's you know we yeah. don't want to walk away from these things uh, mm -hmm. clean. Mm -hmm. So uh, I mean, <sighs> like uh, it's it's cool we got these performances, but I mean there's also a side to it. You go. What can we change to still get that same thing and not have a bunch of hurt feelings? And, and I, I respect that. And I and, and I feel like everybody should have an appreciation and a respect for each other. And just, and just on a base level, you know, to begin with. If we're blocking something on stage and somebody's got to grab me, you know, yeah, we just we should communicate on what's going to happen beforehand. You know, it's just uh, simple respect. You know, what, what I worry about and what I have seen 
in the last, you know, since I was in middle school up until now, we are so much emotionally baby proofing every surface <laughs> that do you remember when you were a kid and you're like you you, you ran into the wall or, or, or the end table or whatever like that and you were shocked and you look up to your parents to see their reaction and if and if they uh were like you're okay you're all right all right rub it out you're okay pal mm -hmm. and you're like yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay. But if you look at your parents and then they look at you like, oh my God, are you okay? You like a parent? <laughs> what you're telling and me, it's okay to not be okay at this. Yeah, at this, at this stimulus. Okay. And it feels like every generation that comes into theater, there's just more and more and more of that. And it's like, I remember, you know, at one point, like we we were gravitating towards theater because it was provocative, because it explored those. Mm -hmm uncomfortable <laughs> moments put them on stage and then you, you, you know then you can transmute them you yeah. know you, you use yeah. it through catharsis but I, I i don't mean to minimize anybody's thing but it's like we all got things you know yeah yeah you you're right you're right everybody's got something that you know maybe they're not coming every day and going hey let me tell you about my past trauma so we can avoid that while we go on stage but i think it, it is about achieving a balance between the two yeah you know, I mean, the plays aren't changing. <laughs> yeah, I would say that we're pendulum swinging the other way and we'll eventually come back to neutral where it's like, we're, oh, brush it off, kid. You don't cry. No cry at baseball. And now we're like, oh, honey, tell me about your feelings and how you've been over the last several weeks. And let's, let's make sure we're really not touching any buttons. And I think we're going to approach neutral response, I, I empathetic think, neutral response. I think we're coming up with a synthesis mm -hmm. of, a combination okay. yeah yeah i mean it's it's all evolving mm -hmm. it's it's just it's just getting from one thing to the next yeah, and going okay out. yeah i mean uh, that's that's the funny thing about humanity is it's well, uh, okay. all about extremes yeah they're not good I think at, the other yeah. thing that needs to be taken into consideration here is uh i would wager with the exception of aaron and i you two are probably millennials correct yeah no okay. was it born in 81 you're a millennial elder millennial you're an elder okay. but you're i'm gen x no, you're not Gen X. Sorry, buddy. Elder millennial. You, well, I think I'm closer to you. You are. Too. You are. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree, but you are considered what they what they call an elder okay, millennial. Okay, technically. Aaron and I would definitely be deeper into the Gen X, because uh, I mean, and and I and I guess I'm I'm, I'm, I'm presuming with you. I I get I don't even know how old you are, truthfully. Forty three. Okay. I'm so, forty one. Okay. <laughs> okay. So actually, welcome to the party. Test. Twelve. Forty three. You were born in eighty. Nine seventy nine. Seventy nine. You are literally on the cusp. Yep. Eighty is where it changes. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, no, he would still be an exer. So, but and you would definitely be falling into that zennial uh, elder millennial. Whereas, how old are you, Tess? I don't know. I'm, sorry. I'm just thirty-one. Okay, clearly a millennial over here. <laughs> um, clearly. <laughs> that being said, I see it all the time with these younger kids younger millennials and the gen z it is a completely different group of people they are more in touch if you will with their feelings whereas you and you and you me sorry i'm calling myself you here we definitely have a different take on those things it's completely different it was okay for us to ride in the back of the pickup at 80 miles an hour yeah i know you did it yep um but yet you ask a gen z if they've done it they're like oh my god no seatbelt no airbag what are you talking well, about? And that's the thing. And, and not to interrupt you, I'm sorry. No, you're good. You're good. Right. Well, and, and it's like, remember playground equipment? Yes, completely yeah, different. Like, <laughs> like, they used to be, they used to be <laughs> fun, <laughs> but they also it's associated dangerous. a lot of danger and injury. <laughs> How many you times know? did you twist your rifle coming off that giant know, slide? We, yep. But would we rather be anywhere else? No, yeah, right, it wouldn't want right. to be inside. So it's like, I think this is the thing for everything that it's like the more you try to eliminate catastrophe, eliminate pain, you know, yes, you, I, I you think, could be successful in doing that, but you also eliminate the potential. You know? you're, eliminating, you're eliminating the human condition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you start making things so, and I have no problems, like, so let me give a little bit of context here. Uh, two years ago, we did Rocky Horror. Mm -hmm. It's the first time I've ever done Rocky Horror on stage, and I very much wanted to do it, and I felt comfortable doing it with Aaron. Tess made a comment earlier about didn't do theater in college because she was fat. 
I am a very large man. I was very uncomfortable doing Rocky Horror because Rocky Horror is a sexy show. Right? Yeah, it is. I was it's uncomfortable doing it. I've never felt more comfortable than the way Aaron made me feel. That's on stage. Awesome. That's so um, However, <laughs> one of the things that Aaron did very first rehearsal that we went through was intimacy training. He made sure that we all were comfortable touching each other. My first thought was, really? Hmm. And then we did it, and I'm like, yep, absolutely. It, it was it's, needed. It was. So, the discussion. Now, some of it was, was because we were working, like, because uh, you pay, uh, paired me up with Bailey Hansen, who is, mm -hmm. could, I could be her dad. And it was super awkward for me working with this person who was, like, closer in age to my, my children than she is to me. And I'm touching her, not inappropriately at all, but touching her, and it made, it made me uncomfortable mm -hmm. touching mm -hmm. her. And it actually has made me a lot more considerate about touching people in general. And like, I'm not a big touchy person. I don't go around just touching people, but like, I think about how I touch people now mm -hmm. because of that. And I think that's okay. I think it's okay to be sensitive to those kind of things. But I also agree that there has to come a point where it's like, okay, you also need to be tough enough to get through this. Mm -hmm. You also need to understand that there are times where you are going to be uncomfortable and you have to be yeah. okay with being uncomfortable. Othello, okay. You have to be willing to see yourself as capable of killing people, especially your lover. Mm. You have to do that. The play is not changing. Yeah. So, okay. so we have to be able to put ourselves in those shoes, but still understand that as actors, we have to leave the building and, and not let that keep us up at night. Well, and, and I think that... I think our very approach to our craft will will dictate that. Mm -hmm. um, I am not a fan of the method. Ugh, um, I, I hate it. I took a class in New York City, and it was a decently prominent guy and good resume, and everybody's serious there. And you know, I had briefly been you know and you know told about it in college, but this was the real deal. And I was like, wait a minute. I've got to access my memories, you know, the only thing I'll ever truly own, and I've got to use them to play in this one-act show and blah, 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 you know? And they were really asking you to mess yourself up, yep. you know, like attaching yourself to that. And it's like, I, I much, you know, prefer the whole imagination technique. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So here, bringing it back to this story, there's this great old theater story um, where you know here we've heard Olivier like, "No, three shades darker, please," and you're like, "Jesus, buddy, you, one, you probably shouldn't have done the role in the first place because in 1963 over in America we were having this little civil rights movement." Yeah. <laughs> but in I think it was '82, Marathon Man, he's opposite Dustin Hoffman, who is like going severely method and it was Lawrence Olivier yep. who comes to him and goes uh, well done Dustin but next time maybe you could try acting <laughs> so, so the story was, it, it was fun because Lawrence Olivier played this Nazi doctor, oh, doctor wow. yeah, yeah. yeah terrible it's terrible bad. and so uh, Dustin Hoffman you know um, super method he was just like you know, I put rocks in my shoes for rats and rich, so I do all this. You played that insane. Like, what was your process? And he's like, I act. You don't have to. And I feel like this is true to life. You don't have to make things so serious and take no. things so serious. No. You know, and it's like, I know that I went, you know, I was attracted to theater because it was... A, I, I had so many pent up emotions as an awkward, you know, young person sure. that has so much to say, but I didn't have the words to say it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. So it's like I got to use other people's words and I get yep. to express emotions, you know, that might not have been mine, but at the height that you know, that I carried them. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, hey, you want to hear some epilogues on this story? Yeah. You know, they never work together again. But <laughs> Sir Lawrence Olivier stepped down as the artistic director of the National Theater in 1973. Before he left, he had established the National as more of an actor's theater, where new and old talent alike could work side by side, not just to expand the craft of acting, but also to exemplify the contributions of the British to the art of theater as a whole. 
So I think, you know, accomplish the mission statement. By the time Olivier left, the acting company of the National was at least 50 members in number. Plus, Olivier had established full plans to complete a new building on the south bank of the Thames. The building was open in 1976 and still stands there today. Final. How long did it take for that? Like that? <laughs> 13, 14 night, years. They, the bill passed in 49. Oh, well, there you go. Wow. Dame Maggie Smith has gone on to much more fame and fortune on stage and screen with many memorable parts, some of which I mentioned earlier. The 2018 documentary... Tea with the Dames focused on the lives and stories of three amazing British leading ladies, Dame Judi Dench, Dame Joan Plowright, who incidentally was married to Olivier during the years discussed on this episode, and of course, Dame Maggie Smith. In this documentary, her longtime friend, Dame Judi Dench, had this to say about Dame Maggie. There are no flies on Maggie. Dame Maggie Smith was awarded her knighthood in 2014. That's the story of Lawrence Olivier versus Maggie Smith. That's awesome. Whew. I think she won. I think she won. <laughs> I, mean, I agree. I think she just proved she's a badass. I mean, there is kind of an unfortunate thing about every hero does have skeletons in their closet, of frankly. And, you know, <laughs> Olivier is such an inspiration to so many across the world of theater and film and everything. But at the same time, he was human. And sometimes we as people let our negative urges get the better of us. Well, I just think it's just another case that, you know, something that we're acutely aware of nowadays of mm -hmm. having to separate the craft from the human being who's performing it. Yeah. You know, and having like tremendous admiration. I feel like that that facade is it is falling away. It's like mm -hmm. now we expect you to have visited Jeffrey Epstein's island. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no Chomsky, dude. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Well, maybe it'll be end up being like a positive thing to where we just end up being like it, how silly it is to you know to put these people on pedestals. You yeah. Know? It's like we're we're not going to be able to find what we're looking for by putting them on pedestals. Right. We might be you know putting a person on a pedestal and we more want to put an ideal right what they represent yes. with, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. um, well because people are flawed yeah. ideals are not i will say this you know not to put anybody on a pedestal but she lived longer than him <laughs> 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 wait he was <laughs> bored <laughs> <before now. laughs> sorry <laughs> little pedestal <laughs> So, what do you think? Are you in favor of the way theater is progressing? I, for one, am a strong advocate for protecting our minds and our hearts on stage mainly for this. Plays are written about the most significant moments of these characters' lives, which often can be quite traumatic. Why should we, as the actors, put ourselves at hazard with our safety in that regard? So, thanks for listening today, and I hope you'll be back for more. Our next episode features our first guests from Australia, musical theater artist Olivia Ruggiero and two of her student performers in a production of the musical Little Women at the Fairfield School for the Arts in Sydney. That episode will be available in two weeks, and I will see you at intermission. I love you.